He's, I'm going to read just a few quotes from the book Socialism, first published in English in 1936. Socialism is not the pioneer of a better and finer world, but the spoiler of what thousands of years of civilization have created. It does not build, it destroys, for destruction is the essence of it. It produces nothing. It only consumes what the social order based on private ownership in the means of production has created. Each step leading towards socialism must, must exhaust itself in the destruction of what already exists. That was also, there was always a two-pronged strategy by the socialists. One, destroy the existing institutions of society and then build their utopia, step two, whatever their utopia might be. Uh, then he said something that reminded me a lot of Sweden and Venezuela. He said this, progressive capital formation is the only means by which the position of the great masses can be permanently improved. Socialism and destructionism propose to use up capital so as to achieve present wealth at the expense of the future. The policy of destructionism is the policy of the spendthrift who dissipates his inheritance regardless of the future. And uh, you know the story of Sweden is that they were, it was a great uh, high economic liberty society in the late 19th, early 20th century. They had all these great entrepreneurs that had created Volvo, uh, you know, automobiles and, and, and all companies like that, Saab and, and many others. And then when they adopted their version of socialism in the 1950s, they basically started eating up their capital, living off the efforts of previous generations until by the 1980s, they had 500% interest rates. And they've been trying to escape from that ever since. And of course, Venezuela, the exact same thing. One of the wealthiest countries in Latin America for, for a long, long time, they adopted socialism uh, basically in the 50s also. And uh, each president that they elected since then, they adopted democracy in 1958, uh, I, I think of as a, a bigger Castro loving communist than the last guy. And look at what has happened to them. So they lived off the capital of the previous generation. A third quote from Mises, he said, for Karl Marx, quote, all politics was only the continuation of war by other means. The socialist parties who have taken the Marxist parties for their model have elaborated the technique of agitation, the caging for votes and for souls, the stirring up of electoral excitement, the street demonstrations and the terrorism. And this reminds me of, I wrote notes here, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, Democratic Socialists of America, the, the, the muddle-headed babbling students who set buildings on fire and scream in the faces of conservatives or, or libertarians who show up at places like Berkeley to give an invited lecture. Uh, that, that's you know, nothing new, nothing new. Mises uh, observed that. He made a comment also on uh, the fake news of his day. He said this, the, the literati are recruiting agents for socialism since socialism must destroy society and they are paving the way for destructionism, the literati. He also made a comment that I put in the politically correct category of commentary. He said this, peoples which have hailed with great enthusiasm, the writings which call for the destruction of all cultural values are themselves on the verge of a great social catastrophe. So he was criticizing what today we would call political correctness. And then he uh, sort of concludes that our whole life is so given over to destructionism that one can name hardly a field into which it has not penetrated. Social art, he put quotation marks over social. Social art preaches it, schools teach it, the churches disseminate it. And so that's destructionism. And of course, he talks about the methods. You know, he, he says, I'm going to have a, a, a brief discussion of some of the methods of, of uh, destructionism. And this is 1922. Labor legislation, compulsory social insurance, uh, un unemployment insurance, nationalization, taxation, and inflation is what he writes about. And of course, in his day, um, he was uh, also commenting on, if you look at um, the Communist Manifesto, which I use in a class, I have a class I teach called Capitalism and Its Critics. And I have I've had students read the Communist Manifesto and the works by social, of socialism, the book Socialism, and go back and forth, the good guys and the bad guys uh, read this. And one of my students told me, you know, this is the fourth time I've been assigned the Communist Manifesto, but, but, but th this is the first time it wasn't looked at as a roadmap to the future. <laughs> it was very, very different. And, uh, true story. That's, that's, a, that's a, a, absolutely true. 
And the same student once told me, I didn't know there were, I had no idea there were different schools of thought in economics. I, I thought it was all a system of equations, mathematical equations. <laughs> yeah, this is a junior economics major that told me that. <clears throat> and of course, if you look at the Kami Manifesto, it's, it's a manifesto for how to destroy the existing capitalist society. Uh, plank number one, abolition of private property. Plank number two, uh, this is a direct quote, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. That's another attack on private property. Number four is confiscation, confiscation of land of those who speak out against the government. That's a direct quote from the Commie Manifesto. So that's a, that's a twofer. That's a destruction of private property and a destruction of free speech at the same time. Number five, centralization of credit in the hands of the state. So, you know, I put a, I have a little picture, of, it says uh, Greenspan, Bernanke, and the, and the margin over here. <clears throat> I gave a talk <clears throat> at the Cato Institute many years ago on the 100th anniversary of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And I, I, for some reason, Alan Greenspan came up, and I remember mentioning that uh, I read one of Greenspan's old articles on antitrust from one of his Ayn Rand days, and, uh, and I commented that, uh, well, that's before he became a central planner. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, some of the people at Cato had a big sourpuss looks on their face when I said <laughs> that. They, they didn't want people to think of the Fed as a central planning agency, of God, for God's sake. You know, uh, <clears throat> centralization of communication and transportation, nationalization of all land and capital, and my favorite, free education in government schools. So that was that was the recipe for destructionism, Misesian destructionism in the Communist Manifesto, which he was talking about. And of course, in our day, it's a little different. Uh, the, 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 the methods of destructionism, we, you know, we've, we've adopted all these things. It's all, you know, in the, in the United States, we've got every one of these things. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, we've adopted them. But we're going even further today. We're going much further today. And uh, you know that today's Marxists, the ones that are most influential, go by the name of cultural Marxists. A little different, different variety of uh, Marxism. <clears throat> and, uh, as I've said before, after the worldwide collapse of socialism in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a, a conundrum among the Marxists. Uh, what are we going to do now? Uh, some of them became what I call watermelons, green on the outside, red on the inside, environmentalists, <laughs> and decided to try to destroy capitalism in the, in the name of the worms and the bugs and the snakes and, and you know, Mother Nature and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> and uh, the old class conf conflict theory didn't fly because the working class never wanted to uh, engage in a bloody revolution and take over the factories. They just wanted a pay raise and better working conditions. And so the Marxists of the day were very upset that uh, the working class never bought into this. <clears throat> so what do we do? Well, they set up a different type of class struggle. It's no longer the capitalist class and the, and the working class. Now it's the oppressor class and the oppressed class. And basically the oppressors are white heterosexual males and the oppressed is everybody else <laughs> in, in, in the literature. And the goal, <clears throat> so because the failure of the working class to, to overthrow capitalism, uh, the goal now is the destruction of Western culture because some of the theorists, people like uh, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist, and uh, George Lukács, his real name is uh, Georgi, but I'll call him George uh, Lukács, they, they needed a change of strategy. And their theory was that the reason why the working class did not embrace uh, Marxist revolutions was that Western culture and Christianity blinded them to the Marxist truth. And they claimed that the combination of Western culture, which of course would include classical liberalism, the philosophy of cl classical liberalism and the institutions of capitalism themselves and Christianity <clears throat> created what uh, Lukács called a hegemonic power which maintains the uh, consent to the capitalist order. So he said the, the working class was too attached to Western culture and too attached to Christianity to, to be able to be convinced into destroying the capitalist order. Therefore, we must destroy Western culture and destroy Christianity. And uh, otherwise, we will never be, have, uh, be able to have our uh, cultural revolution. And uh, you know, one good thing that Mussolini did is he imprisoned Gramsci. He said, <laughs> and, 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 so he said, give him a, a, a hat, hat tip, a hat tip to Benito Mussolini uh, for, for doing that when, when, after he started saying things like this. You know? and, and of course, Gramsci is known for uh, 
uh, you know, Western culture and Christianity must be destroyed by a long march through the institutions of schools, media, churches, entertainment industry, etc. And, you know, so, and you, I, be, I began noticing this, the, the real success that the Gramskyites and the, the cultural Marxists were having in the 1980s when that great uh, intellectual giant, Jesse Jackson, led, a, uh, <laughs> led, led a, a, a group of chanting, 500 or so chanting students at Stanford. They were chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western cultures, Western civ has got to go. At the time, uh, Stanford University was teaching a course in Western civilization, and they wanted to get rid of it, which they did, which they did. They got rid of it, and they replaced it with a course uh, called Race, Class, and Gender Studies. And so they succeeded in that. Around the same time, uh, there was a wealthy oil family from Texas, the Bass family, gave $20 million, $20 million to Yale University, which, which was sort of the family alma mater uh, there, and to endow some professorships and teaching various aspects of uh, Western civilization at Yale. And the faculty, not, all, not every single faculty member, but a, a big proportion, big portion of the faculty revolted against this and ended up they had to give the money back. They gave $20 million back. And, and at the time, it was the biggest donation ever in the history of Yale University, biggest private donation. So so if there are any uh, members of the Bass family watching, you know, I'm looking at the, they're on the internet, uh, uh, send the money to the Mises Institute. We, <laughs> we, we, uh, if they're out there on the internet. So, we will have we will have a uh, degree granting program in all aspects of Western civilization, if you like. <laughs> we, we could do that with twenty million dollars. Okay, so so Stanford uh, replaced that. They gave the money back at Yale. The, the Yale faculty commend, uh, co condemned the, this proposal as uh, it was quote dead white European male academic agenda. And so they called for more multi. We, what we need is more multicultural studies. They said. And uh, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, too familiar with uh, multiculturalism in the academic context, it doesn't mean what you think it means. It means hiring socialists of different cultures, uh, <laughs> an Asian socialist, an African socialist, you know, different culture, an Indian socialist. So as long as the faculty are all socialists, we want them to be from different cultures. That's what, basically what multiculturalism means in the academic, academic world. There is a question I've had for a very long time, and it has to do with this map. This is a map of the 18 states in the US where Democrats control the legislative and executive branches or else have some veto-proof majority in the legislature. Democrats in DC often blame the GOP for foiling their progressive vision. When middle class families see their taxes go up, they'll know Republicans are to blame. But if you zoom into these 18 states, there's effectively no Republicans standing in the way. So my question is, what do Democrats actually do when they have all the power? To answer this question, I teamed up with the Times editorial board writer, Binya Applebaum. Okay, you got my attention. He's been thinking about and writing books about and reporting on this topic for decades. I think, you know, Americans tend to view politics as a competition of us versus them. And, and they tend to think that if they would just get out of the way, then we can do the things that we want to do. There is no them standing in the way. There's just the we of Democrats and their supporters, and they get to decide what policy should look like in those states. And that is an opportunity for them to implement their vision. For this story, I also delved into this giant document. It is the 2020 Democratic Party platform. If you want to really understand what Democrats say they want, what their vision is for America, it's found inside of this document. This document serves as a guide. As we zoom into these states to answer this question, what do Democrats really do when they have all the power? Nearly 554,000 homeless people from the 25 wealthiest Americans shows they're paying little in income taxes compared to their fortunes, sometimes nothing at all. We cannot, in good faith, blame the Republican Party when House Democrats have a majority. There's still very intense segregation happening in all kinds of forms all over this country. Okay, so let's start with California. 
To me, California is like the quintessential liberal state. From the state legislature to the whole executive branch to most of the big cities, Dems hold majority control. So what do they do with all this power? Looking at California, you have to look at housing. Okay, now wait, listen. When I hear the words housing policy, I tend to sort of doze off, but Binya insists that housing policy and what is happening in California is definitely worth looking at. You cannot say that you are against inequality in America unless you are willing to have affordable housing built in your neighborhood. And Democrats completely agree here in this document. The word housing is mentioned over a hundred times. The neighborhood where you're born has a huge influence on the rest of your life. Children who are born in neighborhoods with degraded environmental conditions, with a lack of access to high quality public services, poor schools, poor public transit, are at a permanent disadvantage. And they even say verbatim, housing in America should be stable, accessible, safe, healthy, energy efficient, and above all, affordable. Housing is a human right. Housing is a human right. The rent is going through the roof. Housing is a human right. How does California do when it comes to housing? You know where those signs are when you drive into a state that says, welcome to California? They might as well replace them with signs that say, keep out. Because in California, the cost of housing is so high that for many people, it's simply unaffordable. The, the state has simply, for the most part, stopped building housing. I mean, there are cranes, there's housing going up, but it has slowed down over time really, really sharply and it is nowhere near sufficient to keep pace with California's population. And so what you have is, is not enough housing and too many people trying to get it, and the inevitable result is that prices have gone up, up, and away. The median price of a home in San Diego County is now a staggering $830,000. All around California, there are cities full of people who say that they are progressive, they're liberals. They believe in a more equal America, a more diverse America. They show up to the marches, they put in the lawn signs about everyone being equal, but at the same time, they're actively fighting to keep their neighborhoods looking like this. Okay, wait, but that doesn't look so bad. It's just a bunch of houses in a neighborhood, right? No, it turns out that this is actually the result of specific policies, intentional policies that keeps these neighborhoods spread out and full of single family homes, as opposed to higher density buildings like duplexes or apartment complexes. This is a real serious fight, and you can get a glimpse into it by looking at a zoning map. Yes, we're looking at a municipal zoning map of Palo Alto, California. Don't leave yet, this is really where it sinks in, so just stick around. So everything on this map that is yellow is zoned for single family homes, like this and this. One family can live here. But here in Palo Alto, there are a lot of new jobs. This is a desirable place to live for new opportunities. Over the past eight years, the San Francisco area has added 676,000 jobs, but only 176,000 housing units. So a few years ago, the city council voted to change the zoning of one section of the city right here. Specifically, this two acre plot of land. They wanted to change it from low density housing to higher density housing so that they could build a 60 unit affordable housing complex for elderly members of the community. Okay, so they changed the zoning. Start building the 60 unit complex. No, the overwhelmingly liberal residents of Palo Alto decided to hold a vote to overturn the decision to revert it back to low density single family housing. Back to yellow. And it passed and the zoning was overturned. So now when you go to this plot of land, instead of an affordable housing complex for the elderly, what you're gonna see is this. A row of just a few houses, all of them massive and worth around $5 million each. I think people aren't living their values. You go to these meetings in these neighborhoods where they're talking about a new housing project and it's always the same song and it goes like this. I am very in favor of affordable housing. We need more of it in this community. However, I have some concerns about this project. We have the hearts to do this, but we're doing it wrong and we're dictating and harm onto the neighborhoods. And then off we go with the concerns and then nothing ever gets built. This is happening all over California. And the result is that these neighborhoods are so expensive that they keep anyone out who isn't a part of this small group of super rich residents, many of whom bought their properties decades ago and who spend their time fighting vigorously to keep the value of their real estate assets super high. If you wanna keep Palo Alto the kind of neighborhood and community that we all treasure, 
low intensity, low density, safe for kids to walk to school, you've got to vote against Measure D. There's a, an aspect of sort of, of greed here and, and of uh, you know, nervousness about actually sharing those opportunities. Let's go to another liberal bastion up here in Washington state. The Democratic Party talks about taxation, saying that our tax code has been, quote, rigged against the American people. Democrats all the time are decrying the fact that tax cuts are going to the wealthiest Americans. It is time for a wealth tax in America. Democrats believe in a progressive tax system where the rich pay a larger share of their income than the poor. This is like the most basic policy vision of like a progressive movement. It's front and center in Democrats' policy platform. But if you go and look at Washington state, what you find is that in Washington state, if you look at the, the state and local taxes that people pay there, less affluent families pay a much larger share of their income in taxes than the wealthiest residents of Washington state. So people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, two of the state's most famous and wealthy residents, are in this lovely situation of of paying less in taxes as a share of their income than, than the poor people who live in that same state. And this is a fundamental inversion of the values that the Democratic Party professes. There is no state with a more regressive system of taxation than Washington state. And I'm talking like the most regressive, meaning Texas, which is like the conservative bastion of like anti-taxes, is more progressive than Washington state, liberal Washington state. How is that real? Oh, and guess what? Other states on our map also are in the top 10 of most regressive tax regimes like Nevada and Illinois. There have been some changes, particularly in recent years, but the overall situation remains resistant to change. So I'm very concerned that at this time, which is a very poor time to disincent people from creating jobs in Washington state, that we're even considering it. From that paycheck that you earn, more of that money is going to state government. And so the effect of that is basically to exacerbate inequality. Okay, so rich liberals don't show up when it comes to housing or taxes. Another major theme in this policy document is education. And the wording in here I find quite interesting. The Democrats say, quote, we must provide world-class education in every zip code to every child because education is a critical public good. They use this word zip code to represent the fact that in America, schools get their funding based on the real estate taxes of the houses within that school district. The more expensive the neighborhood, the more funding goes to the school. So over here in Illinois, which is like the quintessential liberal state, there's this one county that contains the city of Chicago. It's called Cook County. The residents here voted overwhelmingly for Democratic candidates in the presidential and senatorial elections last year. Often what would happen is that this would just be one big school district and that all the taxes from all the towns in this county would be put into one bucket and distributed equally throughout the county. But the residents of this very blue Democratic County have actually decided to divide themselves into more than 140 school districts. So now you have all these tiny school districts like this one, which are like gerrymandered around the richest part of town. And so all of the taxes from these rich homeowners go into one little bucket and then only get distributed to the schools within this rich region of the county. It can be on the same block that the town line runs through the middle of it. And if you live on one side of that line, you're consigned to an inferior education by virtue of the fact that you and your neighbors don't have as much money. And if you live on the other side, you're basically a member of a club that is sponsoring a private school, essentially, for the benefit of that small group of kids who are lucky enough to live in that affluent community. And the result is that poor communities have less money to educate their children and rich communities have more money to educate their children. This is crazy. It means basically that the kids who have the greatest needs have the fewest resources. The same thing is happening in wealthy liberal Connecticut, where the inequality in education opportunities is shameful, with some schools having huge budgets for their libraries and facilities, and others in the same state having to use duct tape to keep wind and snow out of their windows. Like this is a real thing. We need your help in establishing guidelines, procedures, and funding to address issues negatively impacting our students like extreme temperatures, mold, lead exposure, and poor water and air quality. So yeah, Binya tells me that the states could change this. They could actually just collect all the real estate taxes 
and then equally distribute them. But if you look at some of our liberal strongholds, that is exactly what they are not doing. Let me be clear about something. In blue states, progress is being made, albeit slowly. For instance, a few weeks ago, California finally passed a law that gets rid of single family zoning. It's a small step in the right direction. And in many cases, blue states provide more and better public services and historically have given better chances to low income families to climb the economic ladder. But for some of these foundational democratic values of housing equality, progressive taxation, and education equality, Democrats don't actually embody their values very well. We're talking, once again, about a system that's been rigged. Republicans today are to blame. What we're talking about here is that blue states are the problem. Blue states are where the housing crisis is located. Blue states are where the disparities in education funding are the most dramatic. Blue states are the places where tens of thousands of homeless people are living on the streets. Blue states are the places where economic inequality is increasing most quickly in this country. This is not a problem of, of not doing well enough. It is, it is a situation where the blue states are the problem. Affluent liberals tend to be really good at showing up to the marches and talking about how they love equality. They're really good at putting signs in their lawn saying that all are welcome here. But by their actions, what they're actually saying is, yes, we believe in these ideals, just not in my backyard. We are not living our values. People who live in blue states, people who profess liberal values, you need to look in the mirror and, and need to understand that they are not taking the actions that are consistent with those values, not just incidentally, not just in small areas, but that some of the most important policy choices. We are denying people the opportunity to prosper and to thrive and to build better lives. And it is happening in places where Democrats control the levers of policy.